Hey all, this is Professor Tracy from Law Simply Explained with another video. This one on the topic of restitution. Restitution is the second of our consideration substitutes. We previously looked at promissory estoppel. Before we jump into the specifics of restitution, let's do a little review to make sure we understand how restitution fits into the big picture here. So we're gonna look at the three causes of action for recovery that we have now that we're adding in restitution. So we started with a promise with consideration. And so the cause of action would be breach of contract. Remember that a promise with consideration is contractual, that it is a promise that is legally enforceable such that if that promise has not been followed through on, if it's breached, then the, the promisee can run into court and seek a remedy to have that promise in forced. And so we said that a promise with consideration is enforceable because it's part of a bargain for exchange. It's part of a contract. In the previous lesson, we looked at promissory estoppel. It, just like restitution, is a consideration substitute. So in the absence of consideration, where we have a promise that ends up being gratuitous for any number of reasons, but primarily that it would be without consideration, then a fallback argument we said would be promissory estoppel. And promissory estoppel is based on the promisee's detrimental reliance on that promise. So remember, we ran through the elements of promissory estoppel in that there had to be a promise made by the promisor to the promisee with an expectation, a reasonable expectation that the promisee would rely on that and that there was actual reliance on the promise. We said we used the but for test that but for the promise, the promisee would not have acted or refrained from acting in the way that they did. And we said that justice requires the enforcement of the promise, meaning that the, there's actually been a detriment to the promisee or harm to the promisee. And then we said there's a remedy and that section 90 of the restatement tells us that that remedy could be limited in the interest of justice. So in other words, it's possible the promisee does not get the full benefit of that promise or the full value, rather they get what's called reliance damages, which is the amount of money they expended in reliance on that promise, rather than putting them monetarily where they expected to be if the promisor had fully followed through and performed what was promised. And we're adding to this today restitution. And just like promissory estoppel, it is a consideration substitute that in the absence of a legally enforceable promise, a contractual promise, it provides another avenue in which a party can seek recovery. And in this case, in the case of restitution, there doesn't even need to be a promise at all. It's based rather on the idea that one party has bestowed a benefit on the other party such that if they did not compensate the party who bestowed the benefit on them, that they would be unjustly enriched, right? They've received a benefit and not to pay for that would be inequitable or unjust or unfair. So such that we say, no, in fairness, they should compensate the party who bestowed the benefit on them for whatever the value of that benefit is. So that's our focus today is on restitution and before we jump into the specifics about that, let's see how these causes of action relate to the remedies that are typically given. So again, we've got these three causes of action Then we want to think what is the interest that we're seeking to vindicate in each of these cases with a contract. We've said this before, but it's an expectation interest. So when it, the injured party is suing for a breach of contract, they're seeking the court to put them where they expected to be if in fact the promisor had followed through on what was promised. So they're saying, 
put me monetarily where I would have been if everything had gone as expected with the contract. Typically, this is going to be the biggest recovery and the best recovery, if possible, for the promise C to seek because most of the time, the promise C is making the contract because it's beneficial to them. So they would want to be put where they expected to be if the contract has gone as expected. With promissory estoppel, we've said it before that the interest there being vindicated is typically reliance, right? That it's about detrimental reliance on the promise and that often therefore the recovery is based in reliance as well. With restitution, it's based on a restitutionary interest, meaning that it's rooted in the idea of unjust enrichment, that one party should be paying the other party for the value of the benefit that was bestowed on them. And the typical remedies then for each of these match up with that interest. So with a contract, it's an expectation interest and the typical remedy is expectation damages, giving the plaintiff the, the money that would put them where they expected to be had everything gone as planned. Now, the other possibility would be something like an order for specific performance, which would be ordering the breaching party to do exactly what it is they had promised to do. And we'll see later that that's not always available. So expectation damages is more the typical remedy. With promissory estoppel, we said that it could be the full value of the promise, but it could be reliance damages. And that would be what's rooted in this reliance interest. Reliance damages, again, being the amount of money that was expended by the promisee in reliance on the promise that was made to them. And restitution is, we say, is rooted in, the remedy is typically what we call disgorgement of the value of what was received. So we're saying that the plaintiff is saying, give me this money that represents the value of the benefit that I bestowed on you. And I've already said that that, that is something that the plaintiff could seek even in the absence, not only of any contract, but in the absence of any promise at all, because it's rooted in the idea of the benefit being bestowed on the defendant and the plaintiff saying, I, in fairness, should be given the value of that benefit that the defendant is now enjoying. So let's look then at a comparison, since our emphasis largely has been on contract and let's compare that to restitution and see how they measure up. So with a contract, remember that there's an actual agreement for, between the parties. It could be an express agreement, meaning that it was with spoken word or written word, but it also could be what's called implied in fact, which is a term we need to get straight because with restitution, we're gonna talk about an implied in law contract, but a contract that's implied in fact means that it's implied from the conduct of the parties. So for instance, if two people are at a bar that's loud and busy and one of them try, waves their hand to get the attention of the bartender and signals to the bartender to, uh, you know, two puts two fingers up and the bartender nods that under the circumstances that conduct is forming a contract. It's implied in fact, right? That that what we can imply from that is that this bar patron is saying, give us two more beers of the kind we have, and I am agreeing to pay for it, and the bartender acknowledging, yes, I will get those beers and have them brought out to you. So there's a contract that can be implied from their conduct, and we call that an implied in fact conduct, which uh, implied in fact contract, which can, we can differentiate from an implied in law contract, which is something that comes up under restitution, which we'll talk about in a second. So with a contract, we have performance, right? The performance of the contract results in a benefit to whoever is receiving that performance. 
and that a breach by the recipients, what we're envisioning is performance by one party to the benefit of that recipient, and then the recipient isn't paying. They're not, they're breaching, they're refusing to pay for the benefit that was bestowed upon them under the contract, and the typical remedy we said would be expectation damages, that the party who bestowed the benefit on the recipient would get money damages that approximate where they would have been if in fact the recipient had paid pursuant to the promises made in the contract. With restitution, we said there doesn't need to be any actual contract or agreement of any kind for there to be uh, the availability of restitution. And what's going on is that one party has bestowed a benefit on the other party and the recipient is now unjustly enriched because they have received this benefit and not paid for it. And what we say there is that we imply a, a contract of sorts. We call it an implied in law contract where we're saying we're going to act as if under the law that this other party who has received the benefit has a duty to pay for the benefit that was bestowed upon them. And so there isn't actually a contract, but we're, we're implying one or acting as if there is one under the law. And we call that an implied in law contract. And we'll explore that more in just a second. So the typical remedy there is restitution that the, the money is going to be paid by the person who received the benefit, and we measure that by the value of whatever the goods or services that were bestowed upon that person, the person who was benefiting. So there's some similarities, but some big differences such that th we need to keep those in mind as we go through. So let's focus then on the material for this particular lesson dealing with restitution. So our general rule for restitution is that a person who is unjustly enriched at the expense of another is subject to liability in restitution. And we're going to focus on two different types of restitution. There is quasi-contract and in, which is often also referred to as implied in law contract and there is what's called promissory restitution. And these are pretty different, and one big difference being, we can see even from the names, that the second one, promissory restitution, requires a promise, and they're kind of aimed at two different things, but they are related, and we'll see that as we walk through. Let's look first at quasi-contract and, and or implied in law contract. Same thing, different names. So here's the rule as it's laid out in the restatement. It says that a plaintiff has, the situation with quasi-contract or implied in law is that the plaintiff has conferred a benefit on the defendant with the defendant's knowledge or appreciation. The defendant accepted the benefit conferred and it would be inequitable for the defendant to retain the benefit without paying fair value through it. So as we do, let's chunk it, break it apart into elements. So the first is that the plaintiff has conferred a benefit on the defendant. And the second is with the defendant's knowledge or appreciation. And third is that the defendant accepted that benefit. And fourth is the, the justice of it, that it would be inequitable for the defendant to retain that benefit without paying, that they would be unjustly enriched if they kept it without compensating the plaintiff for having bestowed that benefit upon them. So we're going to look at each of those elements so we can break them out this way, right? That one, the plaintiff conferred a benefit on the defendant, that the defendant had knowledge of the benefit, meaning they were aware that the benefit was being uh, uh, bestowed upon them, and that the defendant accepted or retained that benefit that was conferred on them, and that it would be inequitable for them not to pay. So when we're looking at that, we also need to keep in mind there are some exceptions. One is what's called an officious intermeddler, which is someone who is voluntarily choosing to bestow a benefit on somebody else in the absence of any legal duty to do so. They are deciding, I'm going to go do this, and yet it's not. it hasn't been requested. 
There's no contract between the parties, nor any attempt to form a contract that somehow failed. There is just somebody voluntarily deciding, I'm going to thrust this benefit upon you. One example you may think about, if you've ever driven around a city, you may have had situations where you pull up to an intersection and somebody comes out with a squeegee and a bucket and squeegees your windshield for you and then wants money for it, right? It's yes, they bestowed a benefit on you, but there was no legal duty for them to do so and you never attempted to make a contract. You didn't request that benefit in any way. And it was a situation where they voluntarily sort of came out of nowhere and thrust the benefit upon you and now want money, right? That would be a kind of a typical example of an officious inner meddler. The other would be if the benefit was bestowed on the other party as a gift, then we don't allow them to later come back and say, hey, give me the value of this gift that I gave you. If the intent was to give a gift from the beginning, then you can't later come back and ask for restitution. And that makes sense, right? If I give you a bicycle for your birthday, I can't come back two days later and be like, you know what, I, I bestowed a benefit upon you. You owe me the value of that bike that I gave you. No, it was intended as a gift. I can't later change that intention and now try to seek restitution from you. So let's look at some typical scenarios. When, when does this idea of restitution come up? The biggest and most important is this first one, where the parties tried to make a contract and it failed for some reason. Obviously, the biggest reason we're focused on right now would be a lack of consideration. So if they attempted to make a contract and yet for some reason there, the, there wasn't consideration, then it wouldn't obviously be an enforceable contract. Whatever promise was made to pay for that benefit fails because of a lack of consideration. Another thing we'll see moving forward is there could be a defense that is applicable that makes it so that whatever contract the parties tried to form is not in fact enforceable, that the contract has been rescinded as a result of some sort of defect that occurred at formation that causes a defense to be applicable. There still, if in fact one of the parties had already performed and bestowed a benefit on the other party, then restitution would be an avenue for seeking some sort of recovery when we have an ineffective contract. So for us, this is one of the biggest areas uh, where restitution would be in, applicable, right? The parties thought they had a contract or tried to make a contract and it failed for lack of consideration or for a defense or for some other reason. And now yet one of the parties has bestowed a benefit on the other one and restitution would be an avenue for giving that party some sort of remedy for having bestowed a benefit on the other party, even though the contract that they attempted to form is not in fact enforceable. So another thing, remember that if we have a attempted contract between family members like a parent and a child, remember there's a presumption that that was done gratuitously and that there must be clear and convincing evidence to the contrary, for us to find that was consideration. Even in the absence of that, right, even if we decide, well, there isn't consideration, there's not enough evidence to overcome this presumption that it was done gratuitously, it still may be the case that the parent or the child in the hypothetical I've laid out here may be able to prove that well, nonetheless, I bestowed a benefit upon you in a situation where it would be just or equitable for the other family member to compensate me for the value that I bestowed upon them, the benefit that was bestowed upon them. So there are some particular rules that come up in situations where somebody has saved the life of somebody else or uh, helped them in a situation where they are uh, in at risk of serious injury or death. So you want to look at these elements because they're very particular 
to these situations, as is the next one, right? So saving lives, saving property are very particular where there are very set elements that must be met in order for the party who bestowed the benefit of a, in this example, three of providing medical care and in the next example of saving somebody's property. So here it must be that the person who bestowed the benefit is a physician or other medical professional and that the situation is an emergency situation. So they're rendering medical services in an emergency situation and it was impossible for the injured party to give consent, meaning that maybe they're unconscious or otherwise in a state where they wouldn't be able to understand what's going on or to give consent to the medical care provided. And that care was necessary to prevent serious bodily harm or pain. So we have a threshold, right, where it's not just any little condition. It must be that the medical care was needed to prevent serious bodily injury or pain that from that injury. And, or obviously above that would be actually saving the person's life. So if all of those elements are met, then restitution would be available to the medical professional uh, or physician. So with saving property, again, we have very particular elements. There must be an emergency situation. So the person is saving property in an emergency and they do so with an expectation of receiving compensation, meaning that they're not doing it just out of the goodness of their heart as, as, you know, as a kindness or as a gift to the other person, but they're doing it with some sort of expectation of I'm going to be compensated for this, whether it's somebody like a tow truck driver or something where it's like they do this kind of thing for compensation, not just out of the goodness of their heart. And that they undertake this with a reasonable belief that the owner actually wanted it saved in this circumstance. So not just their kind of interfering and going, oh, somebody's property, I'm going to try to save it, when in fact, maybe they don't want it saved or they don't think it's worth it given everything that's going on, you know, the state of what that property may be in, given, uh, you know, whatever is causing the emergency in the first place. And then the thing you have to realize here is the person who's rescued the property is entitled to restitution unless the owner of the property actually doesn't want it back. So if they say, I don't want it back, then that allows the person who rescued it to just keep the property that they rescued, um, but they couldn't otherwise seek restitution from the owner of the property. So either way, they would get some sort of recovery because they could keep the property that was rescued or they could get the value of it if the owner accepted it back and the other three elements are met. So those are kind of the typical situations. Let's look at an example here with Bob and Barb. So Barb says, Bob, you owe me. I painted your whole house. You just watched me do it and said nothing. Well, my house did need a fresh coat of paint. If you're willing to do it, who am I to stop you? I hate painting. So here, we, there isn't a promise coming from Barb, but there is a benefit that was bestowed from Barb to Bob. In this case, the painting of his house. And we have this question of, well, did Bob give anything in return, right? Was there consideration for Barb's uh, action here, her performance of painting the house? Was that pursuant to a contract? Was there some sort of benefit coming back? Was it part of an exchange? And the answer here is no, right? There was nothing coming back. It's just a benefit bestowed. It wasn't part of a contract or an exchange. There's no consideration for her performance. And so we would say that it's just a benefit bestowed here. And so we have to look at this and say, well, Barb did bestow a benefit on Bob and he hasn't paid for it, right? He's acknowledged that he received it. And so we have to look at our elements again, right? That the plaintiff conferred a benefit on the defendant. So remember, these are elements of restitution and the defendant had knowledge of the benefit and that the defendant accepted or retained the benefit conferred. And it would be inequitable for defendant not to pay for that benefit. Now, that last element is something we kind of need to think about here 
uh, which we'll get at in just a minute. But the elements here, we can say Barb did confer a benefit on Bob. She painted his house. And Bob had knowledge and appreciation of the benefit, right? Apparently, he saw her painting the house and he understood that and he had an appreciation of that she was, in fact, bestowing a benefit upon him. And he accepted or retained the benefit conferred. And you might look at that and go, well, in this case, what is he going to do? Paint over the paint job or, you know, scrub it off or something like that? And the answer is, that's not quite what we mean with this element in this kind of situation. In this kind of situation, it we would be asking, I think, closely related to the second element, which is if he has knowledge, if he knows that Barb is painting his house and he has the opportunity to tell her, no, 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 please stop. I, I don't want you to do this. I know we had talked about it, but you know, I didn't actually agree to, to compensate you for this or anything like that, then he would have had an opportunity to stop her and he didn't do so, right? So in doing that, he in essence was accepting the benefit that she was conferring. And here, when we're talking about would it be inequitable for him to retain the benefit without paying, we're asking, is he unjustly enriched? In other words, if he if a benefit was conferred, he knew it, he didn't say anything about it, he just let Barb bestow the benefit, wouldn't it be unjust or inequitable for him to not pay for the benefit that was given to him? And the answer here is Yes, all of those seem to be met such that Barb should be able to get restitution. And perhaps we would need a few more facts to make sure they're all met. But assuming they're all met, the answer would be yes. And then we'd want to look and say, well, do any of the exceptions apply? It, and here, again, we maybe don't have quite enough facts to know, did they in fact think they had a contract and it failed? Or, you know, did was Barb intending to paint somebody else's house, say the house next door, and she mistakenly was painting Bob's house, so she had a legal duty to paint somebody's house, but accidentally painted his house, and Bob knew that, and he just kind of accepted it. So here, assuming that she just didn't drive by and voluntarily decide, I'm going to paint Bob's house, that would be an officious intermeddler situation, if there was some reason that she thought she had a duty or some sort of responsibility to paint that house or one nearby, then she wouldn't be an officious in her meddler. Uh, and then there's no evidence that her intent was to give Bob a gift. Again, if she had that intent, she would not be able to get restitution. So assuming those things are, that all the elements are met and none of the exceptions apply, then we impose what we call a, a contract implied in law or a quasi-contract, which is to say we're going to treat it as if the parties had a contract that required Barb to paint Bob's house and in exchange for Bob to pay for the fair market value of whatever that paint job is for the services that he received. So it's a contract implied in law because they didn't actually have a contract, but we're going to treat it as if they did, or we call it a quasi-contract. So we're acting like they had a contract in which Bob has a legal duty to pay for the value of the benefit bestowed on him, even though they didn't actually have a contract. So that is quasi-contract slash implied in law contract. And we said that the second type of restitution is promissory restitution. Let's focus on that second one. And with promissory restitution, the first thing to notice is it says promissory. So it differs from quasi-contract slash implied in law contract because it A, requires a promise, right? So when we look at the general rule, it says a promise made in recognition of a benefit previously received by the promisor from the promisee is binding to the extent necessary to prevent injustice. And your brain should immediately go to the place of this ordinarily does not work, right? Because this is a promise made based on past consideration or moral obligation. And ordinarily, that doesn't work, right? Because it's not consideration. Past consideration does not satisfy the element of consideration. 
nor does um, any, any sort of moral obligation that the person may feel because of the fact that a benefit was made to them and they're saying, oh, I feel like I should pay for this. I promise to pay for it. That sort of uh, moral obligation doesn't satisfy the element of consideration. So this is then an exception, which is why in the past video, when I was listing out the exceptions, to the rules regarding gratuitous promises, that promissory restitution is an exception, right? It's another consideration substitute that in the absence of consideration, which this situation, there would not be consideration, that we, we may enforce it under this doctrine of equity, which is called promissory restitution. So what? how do we break that down? So again, we would break it up and say, we need a promise, that and that promise is made in what in recognition of a benefit previously received by the promisor so the person making the promise it is recognizing that a benefit has previously been bestowed upon them from the promisee the person to whom they're making the promise and then we would say it's binding to the extent necessary to prevent injustice and so that particularly in the context of promissory restitution, is a really important element. Otherwise, this rule for promissory restitution would swallow everything we've said about past consideration and moral obligation. It, it would basically be making a promise enforceable in this context every time. So why did we bother to go through those rules on past consideration and moral obligation? We'll talk about that in just a second. So let's break this out into the separate elements. So we need a promise. The promise is obviously made by the promisor and they're making it in recognition of a benefit that they received in the past from the promisee, the person to whom the promise is made. So one key thing to understand is that the promisor has to be making the promise to the promisee. Uh, to the person that bestowed the benefit upon them, not to somebody else. And we have this fourth element, which is really, really important for us to understand here in order for us to cabin this rule to its proper place as being a, a rule of equity as an exception to our rule that generally in this kind of situation, this promise would not be legally enforceable because it would only be supported by past consideration or moral obligation. So what do we mean to prevent injustice? Well, we're going to look, the restatement says we look at the character of the benefit and we're going to look at how formal was the promise that was made and we're going to look at has there been any performance of the promise already? So from this part, this uh, consideration, this factor that we're looking at, we're looking at it from the perspective of the promisor and saying, did they perform this promise in any way already? And then the last factor, we're looking at it the opposite way, right? We're looking at it from the promisee and saying, to what extent did the promisee already rely on this? So as we're looking at these elements, the first factor is really important, which is what's the character of the benefit that the promisee bestowed on the promisor? Because remember what these factors, these aren't elements. These are factors that restatement section 86 says we should consider when we're thinking about is it necessary to enforce this promise in order to prevent injustice? And one of the things they focus on is the character of the benefit that was bestowed. Remember that the prototypical case here, the paradigmatic case would be Webb v. McGowan, where a guy is literally sacrificing his body, his life, in order to save another person from death or serious injury. And he does so to the extent that he himself is paralyzed in the process of saving this other person's life. You remember he jumps on the pine block, steers it out of the way in order to prevent the other guy from being crushed. And then the guy who was, whose life was saved is promising 
to support this other guy who's no longer able to do his job because of his actions in saving the other guy's life. So the character of the benefit there is substantial, right? And, and extreme. It's not just something like, hey, you can borrow my lawnmower. It's I am sacrificing my own uh, body in order to benefit you. And so often courts will limit this doctrine of promissory restitution to much more extreme situations, not just every situation in which some sort of benefit was bestowed and the party is recognizing that benefit after the fact. And so we need to think about, does it fit that pattern? What's the character of the benefit? And then in looking those other things, again, these are factors. We don't necessarily need them all. And, but we need to think about these things when we're thinking about what is, is it necessary to enforce this promise to prevent injustice? Keeping in mind that if we apply the doctrine of promissory restitution all the time, it's going to swallow our rules about past consideration and moral obligation. So there are exceptions, just like with restitution, if the benefit that was bestowed was intended as a gift by the promisee, then again, we're not going to enforce the promise that's made later. Even if the person, and you, you've probably seen these situations or been involved where someone's like, oh, no, no, you shouldn't have done that. Um, you know, I, I want to pay you for that. Well, if it was intended as a gift to the person, then that promise is not, we're not going to use the doctrine of promissory restitution in order to enforce that promise because it was intended as a gift by the promisee. And then this one's really important and why we refer to this as promissory restitution, right? We've talked about why is it promissory? Well, there's got to be a promise made by the person who received the benefit to the promisee who's the person who bestowed the benefit upon them. But the second part is it's restitutionary, meaning that what the even regardless of what the promise was made, whatever the value of that promise is, we're only going to enforce it to the extent of the value of the benefit bestowed. So we're measuring recovery just like we did under plain old restitution, which was quasi contract implied in law, where the defendant had to pay for the value of the benefit received. Here, there's a promise, but that promise will only be enforced up to the value of the benefit bestowed. So that's an important limitation here on promissory restitution and what makes it restitutionary. So if we look at another example here with Barb and Bob, we can see Bob says, Barb, finally, where have you been? I found your black chihuahua Vader last week. I've been taking care of him until I could get a hold of you, but you've been impossible to track down. Oh, thank you, Bob. I had to make an unexpected trip up to Maryland. My mom fell again, was hospitalized. I was so worried about Vader. I'm so glad you found him and have been caring for the little guy. I'll glad you pay you $500 for all your trouble. So she's, she, Barb, is making a promise to pay Bob $500 for his care of Vader. So we have to ask, well, is there consideration for this promise that Barb has made to pay Bob $500. And we know the answer to that is no, right? Because the promise is made in recognition of something that Bob did in the past. So her promise to pay Bob $500 did not induce him to care for Vader because he had already done it. So the past consideration doesn't satisfy the element of consideration. And any sense of, oh, I feel like I should pay Bob for this because it's the right thing to do or the just thing to do, that's more obligation. And that too does not satisfy the element of consideration. So we know there's no consideration, but nonetheless, Bob did bestow a benefit on Barb, and here a fairly substantial one, and it and she's made a promise to compensate Bob $500 for what he did. 
So we have to ask, okay, if we can't enforce it as a contract, we do have a promise. Should we use the doctrine of promissory restitution? So we have to say, well, are the elements of promissory restitution met, right? Let's remind ourselves of those elements. Is, do we have a promise? Was it made in recognition of a benefit previously received by the promisor? Or did that benefit come from the promisee? And is should we enforce that promise to prevent injustice? So let's see, how does that line up? We do know that Barb made a promise to Bob to pay him $500, that it was in recognition of him caring for Vader over the span of a couple weeks of feeding and caring for him, and the care came from Bob, the promise C. So we know the first three are met. There's this question though of, well, should this promise be binding? Should we hold Barb to this promise? Because we need to prevent injustice. So we would need to think about, are all these, are any of these factors kind of in play here? Of, well, what was the character of the benefit? It's certainly not Webb v. McGowan. It's taking care of a dog. Um, and it's over a period of time, and the dog was important, clearly important to Barb. So there is, you know, you could make some argument that, well, this certainly isn't of the magnitude of something like Webb v. McGowan, and that's true. Nonetheless, it's not a trivial benefit, and it was of something gr of great importance to Barb. And it was at an expense or a cost to Bob that he was undertaking to care for, the, for her dog, Vader, over a period of time. And doing so at his expense of buying food and caring for the dog, walking, etc. And so we can say it's not, it, it's fairly substantial. What was the formality of her making a promise? Not particularly great, right? It was an oral promise made when she realized that Bob had cared for her dog and was bringing the dog back to him. Here, was there part performance of this promise? No, Barb had not already paid Bob some portion of the money, and there's no evidence here that Bob, the promisee, had relied on this promise in any way. So if we're gonna say it's necessary to enforce this promise to prevent injustice, it would be because of the character of the benefit that we would say, well, at, at bottom, one, it's clear that Bob did bestow a benefit on Barb at an expense to himself and that that was a benefit that Barb would have wanted. It was important to her. And so although we only have one of these factors from reinstatement section 86, it is still nonetheless, I would argue, maybe the most important one and something that tips in favor of perhaps saying it should be enforceable. You could certainly argue the other way. I'm not saying this is for sure a lock-in that it would be it would fit and he would get recovery under promissory restitution, but there's at least an argument, right? And so we would say, was it intended as a gift? It could have been. We don't know. We don't have facts there, but it doesn't appear that he undertook it just thinking, well, I'm doing this because I'm intending to make a gift to Barb. He Might he have been being kind? Sure. But you've got to be careful not to say every time someone's intending to be kind, that means it was intended as a gift because then you might rarely have any sort of restitution. And no matter what, remember that whatever recovery Bob would get may not be the full value of the promise. He would only get up to the value of the benefit he bestowed. Now, in this case, if someone is dog sitting for you over a couple of weeks, $500 is probably not out of the realm of possibility of what you would pay. I would say it's pretty likely if it's been several weeks that $500 is is, if anything, maybe low, uh, depending on the nature of the care, et cetera. So, um, but we would say it's limited to the value that was bestowed on Barb, whatever that may be. So here, if we're going to enforce it, then we would enforce Barb's promise here to the extent of the value received. So that's promissory restitution. So it does differ from quasi-contract implied in law, but they're both rooted in restitution. And so I hope that's helpful. As always, if you found this lesson helpful, then please like and subscribe to make other people aware of these videos and to keep them coming. I appreciate your support and I wish you the best of luck with your studies.
Thanks, and more will be on the way.